you're excited today. You can shout it out and do a dance, and it's good. Um, we're living in an amazing season. How many of you know that? Not many. Yeah. I mean, we are living in an amazing season. Um, for those who don't know, the Hebrew calendar um, is it's the year 5,779, but it starts actually uh, 6 o'clock in the evening, so about 12 o'clock noon here, that's uh, Israel time. Um, and that's uh, actually the year of um, double, they believe the uh, year of double portion. I want to read something I thought was uh, pretty cool. This is not only the year of fruitfulness of double p- fruit, for the year of fruitfulness begins in the month associated with the tribe of Ephraim, whose name actually means double fruitfulness. How awesome is that? May our hearts be encouraged as we hearken into the shofar blast into 5,779. Uh, I love declaring that over us. Uh, it's been declared over our church that this is the year of double uh, portion. This is the year that we double. I believe this is the season when God is doing amazing things. But I also believe it's a season of new wine and new wineskins. Um, and in that, I've, I've been um, just impressed by a lot of things. And I felt like um, one of the things that I want to talk about this morning is that I believe God wants us to experience his greatness. Uh, everything in Scripture constantly talks about how God and what he has done for us And I feel like if we as believers don't experience the greatness of God in our lives, there's something that we're missing. It's not something that he isn't giving, but there's something that we're missing. And I want to somehow bring that into the the problem that we encounter, is that no weapon formed against them will ever succeed. And if you're really honest in ourselves, we believe the lie that, yes, many weapons have succeeded. And we empower the liar by agreeing with fear, by agreeing with doubt, by agreeing with hopelessness, by agreeing with bad news, by agreeing with accusations. And if that is what we continue on doing, that we will actually not actually live out the promises of God. Because everything that we do is actually our choice. We are, we are given the choice to collaborate with God, to believe the things of God, or we're given the choice to say we don't believe it. So part of our process is constantly fighting and we always find out that um, we feel like we're attacked. We feel like something is at us. And I think when that's our position, then we always live in a constant fight against something that we feel is just out of nowhere attacking us and we lose our identity and we lose our purpose. And I believe there's a huge difference in the way we look at things. If we constantly just look at, I'm being attacked, it puts me into a victim state. I'm being attacked again. I'm being attacked again. And every time I have this idea, when people say I'm being attacked, is I'm just doing nothing wrong and something's happening to me. And it puts me into a state of victim. It puts me in a state of, I'm, I'm not going to be able to get out of this. It puts me into a state where I feel like I really have nothing more to do, but I just have to wait until this attack hopefully is over. And I want to propose that God did not create us to just wait for an attack. And I want to propose to you that actually a lot of the attacks that you're feeling are not an attack at all. There's a difference between an attack and an opposition. There's a difference between an attack and what your purpose and identity is. And I want to bring that out today because I really feel strongly that the Lord uh, asked me to teach on this is because that he says no weapon formed against you will ever prosper. And God is not a liar. So if a weapon prospered, there's something that I did for that weapon to prosper. It's not something that he did. 
That's not putting blame and shame on me, but that's putting responsibility on me. There's a difference between me taking ownership and responsibility instead of receiving blame and shame. Right? If I'm vulnerable enough to say, yes, Satan, I agreed with your lie. Yes, I agreed with that broadcast. I have freedom in that vulnerability that I set myself free by actually the, the truth sets me free. So it just shows everybody else where I am that I'm not as mature or not as whatever you want me to call it. But this is where I am. And it rips up the contract in that moment. But scripture says, because God said so, and his word never fails, that he says, no weapon formed against me will succeed. And you probably can all t tell in your life that somehow or another, you've had a moment in your life where you felt, and you did actually lose. And most of the time, because we have lost battles, because we have done this, actually what happens is that we then believe that we're no longer strong enough, that we are actually victims because we are powerless. And everything in Scripture tells us the opposite. And we've come to realize, as believers, as we go to church, well, you know, being a Christian is tough. It's, you just got to grind. You just got to get through it. Hopefully God returns soon. Who cares if all the other 7 billion people get lost, but at least I'm getting to heaven. Because I'm tired of this life. And that is not, that is not the attitude and the love of a believer. And we have to get to understand the purpose why we are here. And we have to understand the gift that God has given us and the person that he created you to be. That you are created in the image of God, carrying the presence of God, carrying the trinity of God in you to impact this world. So I want to propose to you that God wants you to understand that he wants you to experience his greatness. Not just sporadically, but continually. And I want to talk a little bit to this morning about how to protect that you are actually protected, that you are actually safe, that you are actually secure, and that the lies of the enemy are there to kill and to destroy you. Every time you partner with hopelessness, every time you partner with fear, every time you partner with a lie, you're not going to bring life, but you're going to bring death to you. Now, Proverbs says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, and longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Jesus Christ displayed the heart of the Father in his interactions with his people in his time frame. And he namely eradicated disappointment, torment, sin. He eradicated. That's what he came for. He came and he basically eradicated sickness. Wherever he went, the Bible says, and he healed all. The tormented ones, the ones who were possessed by demons, he actually freed them all. So when Jesus came, he showed the heart of the Father to the people around him. He said, this is who my Father is. He's the one who comes and he brings freedom to the captives, Isaiah 61. Yeah. And that is you and our calling. But we all know when we look at the life of Christ, it wasn't an easy life. From the moment he was born, he was already attacked. But that was not an attack. That was an opposition to his calling. It was the enemy's opposition to the purpose and destiny that Jesus had. And Jesus never was impressed with the attacks. Never. And we shouldn't be either. We shouldn't be impressed by the attacks of the enemy at all. So I believe that no weapon formed against you will ever succeed. That's what scripture says and we actually talk about it as many times as we want to, and we feel like it, especially in hard times, we talk about it. But I guess, what does it actually look like? That no weapon formed against me will ever succeed. It's interesting, because one of the translations I wrote, it, it will not prosper, it will not succeed. In another, a spear that doesn't actually burn, all, all the way penetrate you and come through the other side. Wow. 
But if I let it go through the other side, then I guess the question is, how long am I standing under that? And how much am I actually agreeing? And when did I give up? And in order for us to be able to actually withstand, there's a responsibility that we have to take. I want to read this verse here. In Mark chapter 2, verse 1 and 5, um, it's a story that I want to somewhat weave into today. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. So many gathered that there, there was no room left, no one even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him a paralytic cried, carried by it, four of them. Since they could not get him into the house because of the crowd, <coughs> they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat, and the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I want to propose to you that there is a way how to constantly stand against the enemy, but most of the time it's never going to be by you just by yourself. But it's going to be in a community with people. This guy had a bunch of friends that loved him enough that when he couldn't walk, they carried him. No weapon formed against you will succeed. And sometimes you're so ill, sometimes you're so paralyzed, sometimes you're so hopeless that you need other four people carrying you on a mat to Jesus. And if you're all by yourself, you're never going to get there. There is another story in the scripture that talks about the pool of Bethesda, I believe, where the paralyzed man is laying there for 40 years and he... Uh, Every time, the Bible actually says that he said to Jesus, well, every time somebody moves the water, I, don't, I can't get there. Nobody helps me. And there's again, the scripture tells you there's somebody who is actually sometimes so miserable, nobody wants to hang around you. He just doesn't want anybody or he isolates himself. And basically what it is, there is no healing. No weapon formed against you actually means, yes, I understand that, but you have some responsibility in that. You have some responsibility to say, okay, I'm going to surround myself with people who know the truth. I'm going to surround myself with people who, when I can no longer do it, or when I'm totally messed up, when I'm totally living in sin, they're going to carry me in front to Jesus, and Jesus is going to say, I forgive you. The beautiful story is that Jesus, actually, when you bring somebody to Jesus, he heals them. And when Jesus finds you all alone in your room, all alone doing your own thing, and you blame everybody else for why you are in the mess that you are, even then Jesus comes and says, your sins are forgiven. Because he says the same thing to him. There's a, something about living in community. That is vitally important for every believer. God didn't create you to live by yourself. He created you to live in community, and you will excel at what you were created for only in community, not by yourself. <coughs> so I want to talk a little bit about and give you some scriptural references to the point of why the Bible says no weapon formed against you will ever succeed. And I want to talk to you about some core values. Some core values that are absolutely, absolutely scriptural and truth. And when you feel yourself coming under opposition and under attack, you can actually start verbalizing those. So first of all, in Isaiah 54, it says it very clearly, no weapon formed against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue. I love that, that it says you will refute every tongue. That means every tongue of accusation, even when the enemy starts speaking against you, you have the power and the authority to say no. You see, even if the enemy in his accusation is right, you can still say, I know. I messed up. I agree. I agree that I sinned. I agree I messed up. But I'm just now ripping up my contract with you. I just rip up my partnership with you. I just right now choose to. I know I signed it. But what I'm choosing to do right now is I'm ripping it up. And you can do that a hundred times a day. 
You have the power to say no. You can agree with him. Yes, I did that. Absolutely, I did that. Yes, I believed your lie. Yes, I believed that. But right now, I'm ripping my signature up. I'm no longer believing that. And guess what? Stronghold's gone. You see, but you have to become vulnerable. You have to be able to start being yourself. You can't make excuses. Well, you know, well, you know, well, I, re- I only did it because, and you know, and you kind of rectify why you did it. That's never going to break up the contract. It may make it wet. It may make it look like your signature is kind of like fuzzy. But it's still there. Until you take ownership. And I take ownership and say, yep, that's right. There's no shame in saying, yep, I did that. But my God says, if I confess my sins, he will wash them and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and make me as white as snow because he died for me. And actually, he paid the price already. I will no longer live under punishment. I'll live in freedom. And so I want to talk to you about this. Whenever you're being confronted and attacked, basically, he says in Isaiah 49, See, I have engraved you in the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. You're engraved in the palm of God's hand. Your name is right there. Your name is, he has you right there. So if any weapon formed against you, let me tell you, he has you right in his hand. Nothing is happening to you. He writes this, in Isaiah, he writes this regarding Israel, regarding uh, Jerusalem, the walls, the fallen walls. And Jesus, God says, your walls are ever before me. I have you right there. Don't worry, I'm your wall. I'm your protector. Then it says, you're the apple of God's eye. Do you think if somebody's going to poke somebody's uh, God's eye out? It ain't happening. Zechariah 2, 8 says, For this is what the Lord says Almighty, He who has honored me and has sent my, me against the nations that have plundered for you. For whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. So no weapon formed against you will ever succeed. You need to understand, this is what God says who you are. The Bible says in Romans 8, verse 37 and 39, no, Nothing can separate you from the love of God. It says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any power, neither height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God. No weapon formed against you will ever succeed. Oh, and by the way, let's say you, you did partner with it, and you know, it says in 2 Timothy 2.13, If we're faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So you may not even think he might not even do it for you. He does it for himself because he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He said, I will always be with you. He's not going to give you any time of failure in that sense because he says, I promise you, and what I promise I always fulfill. So no weapon formed against you will ever succeed. I love this. If the enemy's lying tongue starts getting to you. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I want to read you two um, translations. Number one, the first one is uh, NIV. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we all know that. But I love the Passion Translation. It's the more, more literally one. It says, so now the case is closed. How good is that? Now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voices of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. I mean, that is, it doesn't leave any more option. I think that's so good, i got to read it again. So now, in the case, now the case is closed. I mean, talk about somebody who has an absolute. Case closed, the gavel goes down, done. And I mean, it's over. There remains no no accusing voices of condemnation against those who are joined in life union. That means those who have 
a relationship with Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And then I love this, for Paul says, no weapon formed against me will ever succeed because I'm going to run my race. I'm going to run my race. Why? Because my race is who I am, who God created me. I'm going to run my race. I can't run yours, but I can surely run mine. And this one he says in uh, Second Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run such a race that you get the prize. I'm going to run the race. That's what I'm doing, and that's the big difference. Uh, either I'm attacked or am I running the race. What am I doing? If I'm running the race, I'm going to have competition. And my competition isn't you. My competition is the forces of darkness that want to make sure that I don't get to win the prize. It is none of us. It is all the enemy. So no weapon formed against me will ever prosper because I'm going to run my race. It's my race. I take ownership of my race. I love it when Paul got stoned. He goes, this is my race. You're not going to inhibit me of going back right there where I came from. You think you drug me out of the town and beat me with stones? I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to go right back in there because this is my race. I'm running it. I'm not going to let some stones kind of get me out of here. No, I'm not. I'm running right back in. It's because he didn't believe he was attacked. He was just opposed. You don't have the power to attack me. You can just try to oppose me. Because no weapon formed against me will ever succeed. I'm not impressed with your little opposition. Because I know who my creator made me to be. I'm an amazing son and daughter of God. I am created to do this. No weapon formed against me will ever prosper. I've been given everything I need to live a life of godliness. No, you are not going to be enough to stop me because God is for me. Who can be against me? You see, that's my core value. So I change now my thinking. I'm no longer the victim. Oh, I got a tech. Where did that come from? Actually, where it came from is because I'm bumping into the opposition because I'm walking forward. I'm running my race. I'm not, I'm not just sitting eating chips and somebody's throwing stones at me. I'm actually moving forward. That's why I'm encountering stuff. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, I love this. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. We all want to say that. I want to lie on my deathbed when I'm 120 years old. I want to say, I've ran the race. I've finished the fight. You see why? Because no weapon formed against me will ever prosper. It may hit me, but it won't prosper. It will not pierce me through and come out the other side. It will just hit me, but it will not prosper. Why? Because my God is with me. Because of all the reasons we just talked about. And then I love this. There's many more. I'm just going to read one more. Psalm 56, 11 says, and it comes to two other more times in Scripture, same verse, but in different places. I say with confidence, Christ is my helper. What can man do to me? How good is that? Psalm 56. In God, I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? How good is that? That puts fear to men at rest. The case is closed. Fear of men is not to be there. If I'm afraid and if I partner with performance, guess what? I'm afraid of men. So I don't partner with that. My core value is, wait a moment, when the enemy uses all of us against each other because of out of performance, then I'm going to partner with that. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of anything. Why? Because perfect love casts out of fear. I'm loved by God. That's all I need. Psalm 118, 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? In Hebrews 13, 6. That's great because that's just a couple, a, chapter, a couple chapters after the big, 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 big chapter of faith. And it says, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. They're quoting after, actually Psalms. What can man do to me? I love this. Sometimes we still feel kind of wore down. 
And then the Bible comes up with amazing answers. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You have to find people who, when you are tired and weary, that will actually help you. Isaiah 40 actually says this. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, he will renew their strength. And we will soar like eagles. Come on. No weapon formed against you will ever succeed. God wants you to see how amazing you are. He's invested in your amazingness. He is invested in you being the representative that he created you like Jesus. He loves you just as much as he likes Jesus. Amen. We have a choice, like I said earlier. We can live a life of isolation like the crippled man did at the pool, or we can live a life in accountability with community in our tribe. We can live a life like that, and that when we mess up, we have somebody who actually carries us to Jesus. That's our choice. Does the church want to be recognized as the people who actually eat their own, or do we want to recognize as the church that actually we actually help our own? The church has a, actually not that good of a reputation with people and leaders and ch churches who have fallen and have done all sorts of kind of things. We usually just throw them out. We actually partner at that point with the religious spirit and we say, well, that's just ugly. But you know what? The beautiful part is that churches are filled with ugly things. And God, what do we find out? We find the restoration power of Christ. We find the heart of the Father. Everything in Scripture is always about restoration. Everything about Scripture is reconciliation. Everything about Scripture is forgiveness. That's how the Scripture shines. It's these major people and these major mess-ups. It's the Peters, the moment they cry, Oh, the God has showed you this end. Get behind me, Satan. And the church needs to start embracing what actually that means. That true love actually does make no distinction of people. What do you do? We love you through everything. No, and we don't make distinctions about sin and one sin is worse than the other. We don't make distinctions either. You see, the only one who does that is the enemy because he wants to make you feel with certain sins are like, oh my gosh, that's so, oh, I can't. That reason why is because he wants to re reject the people and make them feel all alone. He makes you ugly in front of everybody. And if you and I buy into that, well, that's awful. If you and I have a line, God, the enemy is going to make sure that everybody crosses that line. So you will no longer have mercy on them. But if the church becomes actually the hand of God and the heart of God, then actually, wherever we go, we give freedom. Wherever we go, we influence and give mercy and grace and forgive sins. Ouch. We have attacks of the enemy in our lives. We have assignments of God from... We have assignments from God. And basically what that means is that the enemy will attack you, but the only reason why he attacks you is because you have an assignment. If you wouldn't have an assignment, he wouldn't attack you. He would let you go. You sometimes become a tool for him because you partner with him. But the assignment of God is actually what makes you run in opposition. Because you're going upstream. And boulders are going to hit you. And other fish are going to hit you. And branches are going to hit you. And muddy waters are going to hit you. But you're going upstream. And you're getting tired at times. And you're getting weary at times. But you're going with a big school of other fish. And they're all swimming with you. And you're going upstream because you were created to go upstream. You're designed by God to go upstream.
And when you, have strong, you choose to partner with strongholds and lies of the enemy, those are actually the attacks that you feel. The attacks that you feel is when you actually start partnering with the enemy, you see that your life is going in a different direction where you need to be going. The enemy is attacking me now. You're not taking ownership and responsibility. And you're a decision away to make a change. A decision away to make a change. I want to encourage you in 2 Timothy 2, 1, 13 and 14. It says, what you have heard me keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ. Guard the good deposits that were entrusted in you. No weapon formed against you will ever prosper. The reason why it's not going to prosper is because you're going to guard what God has entrusted and was put in you. Because you're going to guard the truth that he says. You're not going to let the enemy start taking it away. And then you feel helpless. So you won't see it much here, but this is the moon. And you see a slight outline here. You don't know really what it is. A lot of times when you're going into the direction where God shows you to go, you don't know, but suddenly you see opposition. But God's going to give you a little bit more light. And then you finally see, oh. And all it is, and, and I just want to say, I mean, obviously this is God, uh, the enemy is not a tree. But basically what he says, he goes, but wait a moment. This is all it is. Yeah. You can just walk around that. Yeah. But before you look, oh, there's something there. I don't know what it is. It's a big monster. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But no weapon formed against you will prosper. Well, I'll keep on walking. And as I keep on walking, it gets lighter and go, oh, my gosh, that's all it is. It's a tree. And I was so afraid of a tree. I don't have to be afraid. I can just, actually, I can climb the tree. Are you hearing me? This looks to you like a car, and it is a car. <laughs> but I, the, the Lord showed me something that was a, a, a really, really good, and he's still working on that on me because I'm, I'm still processing. I'm going to let you in a little bit about these things. But you can't see it here, but this is a big rust bucket here. And somebody wrote it there, dream. There's the D still. You can't really see it because I've, it's dream big. There's the B-I-G. You can't see much. I know I saw it, but I couldn't get a picture because the guy was like, what are you taking a picture of my car? So I just took it from a little far away so he didn't think I'm like weirdo. But anyway, but it's good enough for me. But the Lord says, dream big. Yeah. And I thought, wow. A year ago when I was at a conference, somebody prophesied over me that God says to you, he can entrust you with things and you need to dream bigger. Like, Okay. I don't even know what that looks like. I thought what I was dreaming was big enough because now I dream bigger. And after I had this, and I'm asking God, God, show me how to dream bigger. I don't know how to dream bigger. Show me how to dream bigger. And then the Lord has been, for the last couple of days, he's been putting some things in my heart that I'm thinking, and actually, like, literally, I see it. And I'm kind of going, this is, like, outrageous. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, yeah, this is, wow. So, and you know how God does things? And you have no idea how, why, but you, you somehow, I watched this show, uh, um, what is it, Locked Up Abroad. It was on, on TV, and I looked at it, and it caught my eye because it was about a guy who got caught in Peru uh, doing something, and it was in the prison that, that I wasn't there, but a lot of people were there, and a couple of my friends were there, not friends, but from people that we knew, their kids and stuff, and sometimes uh, we got called because of foreigners were uh, locked up in there, and it's a prison that is actually, um, it's the second worst prison in the world to be in, and it's, it has a room for 1,500 people, it actually houses 6,000, so, and the story went how he went through, then he came out, and I'm, I'm not thinking of anything of it. I'm just thinking of that. And then the, uh, I was uh, in the shower in the morning the next day, and the Lord just gives me a, a picture of prisons all over America. 
And he gives me a picture of all of the prisons of America, and they're all burning, burning flames, like so burning that they're white in the inside, and they're just burning. I'm like, this is cool. What is that? And God says, the whole prison system in America needs to be totally revamped. Because I don't stand for eternal punishment. I stand for restoration. And we have to make sure that people get restored. And he says, and the prisons of America, I have a plan to make them the intercessory hubs of the world. That every single prison will be a camp of intercession. That actually the prisons will manage themselves. That actually prisons are going to be the worship centers and the amazing prayer and intercessory because the people who are still sitting out their sentences, they're going to agree with what God created them to be. And guess what? And he said to me, the people who are in prison are the ones, just like the ones that the enemy killed with abortion, are the ones that have such a high calling on their lives that they bought into lies and they're actually now sitting in prison, rotting away, not knowing what they were actually created for. And the only reason, and what we have done is we've just, in the earthly way, we said, well, you did wrong, you did these atrocious things, and we'll shut you out and we'll put you in. And we never ask God, what is the design, what is the purpose of that person? What were they created for? Why were they attacked in such a way they didn't even know it, and they're now disqualified from the race forever? That is not your way. Are you hearing me? Well, it's not going to happen tomorrow, you know. It'd be great. But that is what's going to happen in the next generations. I declare and I prophesied into this nation. Prisons are going to be intercessory hubs like prayer houses. And they're going to actually change, not just here, but they're going to change the world. And then the Lord gave me something else just because the bone is run. A lot of the malls are coming down, right? A lot of malls are coming because they don't have nobody. You know, Amazon is so great. Praise God for Amazon. I love Amazon. So you can buy anything there. So a lot of people are not coming anymore there. And the Lord says, yes, and churches are going to become malls. You're going to have churches that actually own the whole malls. where actually family can happen, where you don't have to sit in a little square anymore. You have plenty of room. There's so many abandoned malls in America today. Imagine the church starts inhabiting those malls. Acoustically, it would be amazing. I mean, have a worship service in a mall. You can be on the other side, and oh my gosh, it'll be just gorgeous. And all the people, you have plenty of space, plenty of room. Children's ministry is going to be in the gap. Uh, well, that's not the gap anymore, but, you know. Children's going to be in New York and Company or, or whatever. It's, you know, you're going to have all these things. And they're going to be filled with people belonging again. Because people want to belong. They're going to belong to the tribe of Christ. They're going to belong to the kingdom of God. I don't know, Pastor, have you looked where we are in Stratford and, you know, look at the people? Yeah, that doesn't intimidate me at all because for that I need God. For what I can plan out, I need God. But for that I need God. And I don't care if I see it in my generation or not. But we're going to see it in maybe second, third, or maybe 100 years from now we're going to see that. But God is already putting us into alignment with what he's doing. We have to start looking in a different way. That's pretty cool, right? It's a tree and a cloud. Yeah, I like that. I, I, at least I like it. But actually, it's a car. And I got so, I, I got, wow, that's pretty good. So I took a picture of it, and the Lord says, the new wine is that you have to start looking different. You have to look at things differently than you ever looked before. You have to start looking at ministry. You have to start looking at things in a different light. If you see it in a different light, if you don't, you'll miss the beauty of what you can do. 
we'll miss it. I want to encourage you that no weapon formed against you will prosper. And God is going to give you these things. And now the enemy can, is all intimidated. They're sounding the alarm. And they're going to start rattling and becoming big. But they're full of air. Because we don't partner with their lies. If you don't want to do it, somebody else will do it. It's your choice. Do you want God to do it through you? That'd be fantastic. But if not, if you don't want to do it, he'll do it through somebody else. The end is basically already written, right? God says no weapon formed against you will ever succeed. And so we have to kind of take a look at that. Why is it that I'm being attacked? I'm having opposition to my destiny, that's why. It means that the work that I'm doing is so amazing that the enemy is afraid of what I'm going to wreck all of his time that he has invested in destroying people. There's people each in here and all over the world. You wonder, they've lived a life of misery until maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And suddenly they get saved. And suddenly they're like, and then they find out, oh my gosh, why things are not always so nice and rosy? Well, why do you think the enemy invested 40, 50 years into you to mess you up? He's not going to say, I'm going to give you parole. Are you kidding me? Of course not. He's going to say, I have invested a son. I'm going to make sure this investment pays off. And all you need to say, no, I ain't paying off. I rip up my contract. Don't you see it? It's gone. We don't believe in that stuff no more. I'm done with that. We have fruits. That's why he's opposing us. I like the word opposition instead of attack. Attack makes me feel more like a victim. But opposition is because I'm running into him because I'm going the direction God told me. If I'm going this direction, guess what? In the jungle in, in South America, in the Amazon, you can literally go 30 feet in, and you do not know if, you, if they unfold you with your blinds. You, you're going to go, I don't know where I am. But if you go with a machete, if you go forward, it's not that the plants are attacking you. It's you are going forward, and, you're, and yes, there's a tree. Well, I have to cut down the tree, but that's what I'm doing. But if I stand like this, nothing is attacking me. But if I move forward, that's when I feel attacked, but I'm not. I'm actually having opposition in the direction, the destiny that God created me to do. So I'm empowered now. I'm destined for greatness. And God has given me the tools to walk through. Our identity is that we are created in the image of God. He has given us all authority to do what he created us to do. He have what he appointed us to do. There's people who find their identity in being defenders. If your identity is in opposition, I oppose everything. I oppose this and I oppose that. I oppose this. And my identity is in opposition. As much as how, look how much I oppose. Then you bought into a lie. The most beautiful thing is to partner with the team. The kingdom team. And to go together. It's not about if it's my idea, if it's your idea, if it's somebody. If it's God's idea, I don't care who came up with it. Let's go. I'm here to serve you to do what God has called us to do. I'm not here to prove, oh, I opposed him. I had an opposing voice. Wow. Is that how much you're messed up? There's a nicer way to say that, isn't there? Is that how low our self-esteem is, that we have to pride ourselves in our opposition? You see, the church needs to be known for what they love, not for what they hate. I'd rather be known for what I love and what I support instead of what I oppose. Yeah, yeah. What I oppose, I'll tell people what I oppose, but I'm not going to make a big deal about it. I'm going to be actually 
talking to those people and encourage them for what I'm for. That's so different. We like to just tell everybody what we don't like. Yeah, me, me, I don't like that either. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I don't like that. Well, tell me what you like. Well, I don't know. I don't know what I like. Well, that's a problem. Why can't we talk about what we like? Why can't we talk about what we're for? Because when I know what you're for, you're going to find out that I'm actually for the same thing, maybe. Or very close. So we can walk together. And no weapon formed against me will succeed. Because I'm no longer alone. When I have attacks or opposition, however you want to put it, what is it that I need? I need people around me. Ephesians 6 talks about that. We all know Ephesians. And if we don't know it, we'll, we'll find it. Ephesians 6, 13 says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have stood your ground and done everything you can, stand. It doesn't say, I mean, when, when you're getting a lot of times hit, sometimes it's just better to stand and wear it all off and then you keep on walking again. But not retreating because all the ground you got, you don't want to give that up. God is giving you the ground, so you don't have to give up the ground. You just stand and say, oh, I'm standing here right now. What are you going to do? And he's going to go throw punches, and you go, that ain't going to help me. Yeah. Not going to help you. I'm standing here, yeah. and I'm waiting for some downloads. Yeah. And as soon as I get the downloads, I'm going to kick your, you know what? If there's any attacks that I agree with, with the enemy, when I partner with ho the hopelessness, when I partner with the spirit, when I partner with lies, then he creates a stronghold. And I find myself drifting because it's like some, I, I rope myself up this way and I want to go straight and I can't go straight and I get frustrated and I go, it's an attack, it's an attack. No, I just partner with what the enemy says. Yeah. That's why I can't go forward. Because the Bible says, no weapon formed against me will succeed, prevail. In other words, no accusation will prevail. In other words, when I'm not, I want to go this way, but I'm tied, I'm going to start going in circles. I'm going to start revering to the right or to the left, wherever I, I'm stuck. And that's because I partnered with a stronghold, and I need to cut that loose. I have to go back to my paper and go, oh, wait a moment. Oh, I, right, I signed it again. Oh, gosh, I have to rip this up again. And you rip it up again. You go, I ripped it up already five times, but he always brings me a little paper and says, you want to sign again? And I go, okay, I'll sign my name again. Are you with me? So we need to rip it up again. And when we rip it up, we can see we go straight again. No weapon formed against you will ever prosper. Now, I want to say this to you. Depending on your imprinting, Satan doesn't have to say anything anymore because you already believe the lie. It, the lie became a part of who you are, about your process. So you don't always have to have the broadcast. You don't always have to have Satan. Satan can be on Mars for all I care. And you don't even have to hear him anymore in that respect because... You already believe the lie, and you already are programmed by yourself to do that lie. That's when you need people who are like the four guys who took the paralytic guy, and they drug him to Jesus and say, hey, there he is. You need people that say, wait a moment, you're totally off. I am? I didn't know that. It was Satan. No, no, no. You, you, some years ago, you believed what Satan said. But you, this is part of who you are. I didn't know that. Well, let me help you. Let's bring you to Jesus. Okay, let's bring you to Jesus. And Jesus goes, yep, ah, that sin is forgiven. What? I feel so much better. Yeah. Come on. Get your mat up and walk. All right, now I'm bouncing again. That's the value. That's the value. 
If I hang around bad friends, bad influences that I've been imprinted in, I will never actually know what I'm doing wrong because what they're doing seems all right. So I have to start hanging around the right people, the people who have a transformed mind, the people who are walking in that direction. And you're, you're going to find yourself in that direction. The Bible says, I've given you everything you need. And he says, if it ain't good, all things work for good for those who love him, right? So if it ain't good, it's not done yet. If it's not good, it's not done. 2 Peter 1.3 says that. 2 Peter says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life of godliness. He has given you everything you need. Everything. And all things will work out for good. If it's not good, start persevering. Because it's going to be good. There's new wine. New eyes see things. Not in the obvious, but in the hidden. You wonder why. I just want to uh, uh, read at home. Matthew 10, verse 13. The disciples say, Why do you speak to people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Why? Because you got to search for them. That's why he talks to us in pictures like this. He does, because I'm looking. God, I'm looking, I'm looking. I want to learn more of your language. I want to learn more. He's hiding it for me. How cool is that? So the question I ask then. Well, God, why am I still struggling? When I'm doing all this kind of stuff right, why am I still struggling? What am I missing? I'm learning that I mature in the valleys. There's some things I just don't have. Sometimes I just got to have God's grace to repent. Because I don't see it. What we just talked earlier, Timothy talks about. You must gently reprove those who oppose him in hope that God may grant them repentance. God will grant repentance. But why am I still struggling too? It's because I believe God has given you a destiny and a purpose. And whatever opposition you get is actually to build your character. It's so obvious in Scripture. You look at all of the major men and women of God in Scripture. They got all prophesied gold, silver, diamond, and pearls. I mean, all of them. You're going to be the one. Out of you, I'm going to make the nations, and you're going to be awesome. David, you're going to be the king of Israel. Wow. I mean, you name it. There's so many, and they all had a hard life. Although if you ask them, they wouldn't change it for the world. Why? Because they learned in the process. David learned in the process. Moses learned in the process. And you and I are learning in the process. Because what's actually happening, because of the opposition, I'm constantly reinforcing myself with the truth of God. I'm constantly talking to myself about what is real and what is not. And that is what actually forms me and my, uh, puts my integrity, my form, my, forms my character, and it forms my, my strength and authority for the destiny that I have. And if I get everything I want, well, guess what? It doesn't work. But when I get it through valleys, because the enemy opposes, God is using that opposition. It's not an attack. Let's don't give the enemy more credit than there is. It's not an attack. It's an opposition because I'm going this way. And he's standing in my way. Well, that's not an attack. That's called he's in my way. Because I have a destiny, I have a purpose. It's not, why is my job so bad? Your job isn't bad. You're there to change the job. Yeah. What? Really? Yes. Well, I don't see that changing in years. It doesn't matter. You're changing for the next generation. You're not doing it for you. But my town is so messed up. It doesn't matter. Well, it's going to take so long. It doesn't matter. It's going to build your character. It's going to build your identity. It's going to, God is going to talk truth, and he's going to do tremendous revelations in you. It goes from relationships to marriages to nations. You name it. Oh, it's all there.
if you don't go through that opposition, if you don't go through it, you're going to have a hard time maintaining it. I just believe we're going through such a hard time, us as a, a Word Life Center, as a tribe, we're going through such a hard time building and building and building is because what God has is so big that if we don't really actually strengthen ourselves, we're not going to be able to carry it forever. You see, we can get frustrated and go, oh, it's not happening. Oh, oh. Yeah, what, when, since when did whining help? But what does help is why I constantly renew my mind with what the truth is, what God said about this. God, you promised. God, you prophesied. God, you said. God, you said. God, you said. And guess what? In 20 years, I'm still going to remember, but God, you said. And I'm still not a one of those who've given up, but I'm one of those who's still running my race. And because I'm running the race, I'm going to have opposition. Because my future is so bright. Let's get the sunshades out. If he promotes us before our time, let me tell you, we doom the people and ourselves for destruction. Because we're not going to be good leaders. We're not going to maintain it. I want to finish with this. I don't want to tell people about God. I rather would want to show them God. I don't want to really just answer scripture. But I'd rather have a miraculous sign showing them the kingdom and the heart of the Father. People I've talked to and have struggled with tons of stuff. They're the people who say, you know, it's not like I never asked God. I asked God, and he didn't do anything, so I just did my own. I'm not sure what to answer to that. You know why? Because I can give them a religious answer, but that's not going to help them. They need an encounter with the Lord. And I want to carry with me encounters. I don't want to carry one more Bible verse. And I'm not negating the Bible at all. But people who don't know him, they need an encounter. I want to walk a life, and I believe this is the life, this is the new wine that God is pouring out. This is the new wine. And let me say this to you. Whatever's worked until now, now is not going to work anymore because it hasn't been working for a while. Churches are closing down left and right because they're so sick and tired of religion. They want to have a relationship. They want to feel a part. They want to feel the love, not just hear about love. They want to be a part of a kingdom-building church that actually honors and values them. And that is an absolute different mindset than what we have. It's no longer a custom. It's no longer we go. We desire to go to church to serve one another, to breathe life. We desire to be a part of the kingdom mentality. We desire to be a part of our tribe. And we want to be not exclusive, but inclusive. We want to love everyone, not just a few. And we don't want to just go, well, you're old or you're too young. We want to honor everybody, any age group, any time, anywhere. So it's a new season. Remembering that no weapon formed against that will ever prosper. Remembering that we're created to amazing things. God wants to show his greatness to you and to me and through us to this world. And he's given us all authority to do that. Let's embrace that. Let's do that because in that, the kingdom of God grows. In Jesus' name, amen. That's so great. That's so great. Thank you. Let's just stand and just honor him for that word again. Oh, yes, we thank you for that. And thank you, God, for just that amazing outpouring of your presence today. Woo. So if the prayer team can come forward and um, join me up here, that'd be great.
So um, just as my dad was talking about, um, we just want to dream big. We just want to have that courage. So um, if you want that courage to dream big, if you want that relationship, if you want those things that my dad was talking about today, um, I encourage you to come forward. These people are here to help you with your breakthrough. And they're here to also encourage you on that walk that when you're facing that opposition that you can walk straight through and say, that's my destiny. I'm going there. So these people are here to help you with that. So just take advantage of that. And also this area is also open for if you just want just time with God, it's totally open for that also. And so um, we just want to invite you also to the back and just have some family time with us as we eat. After we have this wonderful spiritual food, we want to have physical food um, so we can grow all in different ways. <laughs> so we just want to invite you in the back. My name is Jessica. I'd love to meet you, and I hope you have a great rest of your week.